On World News Tonight, head-on collision. Two trains crash in Greece, leaving dozens dead and hundreds injured. The world gathers. Foreign ministers around the world, including those from Russia and China, arrive in India ahead of the G20 summit. Bakhmut encircled. Russia uses the Soviet Union's age-old World War II tactic of encirclement to capture Ukraine's Bakhmut. And Dior de Paris. Models clad in sombre colors hit the runway at the Paris Fashion Week. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening to all our viewers watching other than the world news tonight. As we enter the middle of the week, there have been many developments in status quo around the world. From reverting to old war tactics, espionage and getting together to gain a peaceful solution to world conflict. Now we start off tonight in Greece, where rescue workers are in a desperate search for survivors after a head-on collision between two trains in central Greece killed dozens of people and injured scores. Dozens of people were killed and at least 85 injured after two trains collided head-on in Greece late Tuesday. Rescuers combed the crash site through thick plumes of smoke and carried away passengers. The crash happened on the outskirts of the city of Larissa. According to a local governor, the passenger train had been traveling from Athens to Thessaloniki when it smashed into a cargo train. Around 250 passengers were evacuated safely by bus to Thessaloniki. Some arrived with visible wounds. Crash survivor Sturgios Menenis described the ordeal. He said he heard a big bang and for 10 seconds they turned over in the wagon until they fell on their sides. There were cables everywhere on fire, he says, people screaming, trapped with fires to the right and left of them. He said he had no choice but to jump two meters into broken debris and metal underneath them to escape the chaos. Authorities say the first four carriages of the passenger train derailed and the first two carriages were almost completely destroyed in the subsequent fire. It's still unclear what caused the collision. Now over in neighboring India, foreign ministers from around the world have met in New Delhi in the shadow of Russia's war in Ukraine and spiraling US-China tensions, with host India hoping that issues like climate change and third world debt are not overlooked. The March 1st and 2nd meeting of the G20 foreign ministers will be held days after a meeting of finance chiefs of the bloc in Bengaluru, where they wrangled over condemning Russia for the war, failed to reach a consensus on a joint statement and settled instead for a summary document. The outcome was similar to a G20 summit meeting in Bali last November when host Indonesia also issued a final declaration acknowledging differences. Last July, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov walked out of a G20 foreign ministers meeting also in Bali after the West strongly denounced the war. The New Delhi meeting will be attended by Lavrov, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and Britain's James Cleverly, while China is expected to send its foreign minister, Qin Gang. In all, representatives of 40 countries, including non-G20 members invited by India and multilateral organizations will attend. The G20 bloc includes the wealthy G7 democracies as well as Russia, China, India, Australia, Brazil and Saudi Arabia, amongst other countries. A meeting of foreign ministers of the Quad countries, the US, India, Australia and Japan, is also scheduled to be held on the sidelines. An Indian foreign ministry official said that Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government wants to steer the focus of this week's meeting to issues like climate change and the debt of developing nations. He also spoke on the condition of anonymity because he was not authorised to speak to the media. The foreign ministers' meeting will also be watched for how tensions between Washington and Beijing play out, including over the Ukraine war. China, along with Russia, declined to sign the summary statement of the finance chiefs in Bengaluru. Taiwan's defense ministry has stated that it has spotted 19 Chinese Air Force planes in its air defense zone in the past 24 hours, part of what Taipei calls regular harassment by Beijing. Taiwan, which China views as its own territory, has complained for the past three years or so of stepped-up Chinese military activities near the island as Beijing seeks to assert its sovereignty claims. China has said its activities in the area are justified as it seeks to defend its territorial integrity and to warn the United States against colluding with Taiwan, despite the anger this causes in Taipei. Taiwan's defense ministry said 19 J-10 fighters had flown into the southwestern corner of the island's Air Defense Identification Zone, or ADIZ, through closer to the Chinese coast than Taiwan's, according to a map the ministry released.
Taiwan's forces monitored the situation, including sending up its own Air Force planes, the ministry added, using the normal phrasing for its response to such Chinese incursions. No shots have been fired and the Chinese aircraft have been flying in Taiwan's ADIZ, not in its territorial airspace. The ADIZ is a broader area Taiwan monitors and patrols that acts to give it more time to respond to any threats. The democratically elected Taiwanese government has repeatedly offered talks with China, but says the island will defend itself if attacked and that only the Taiwanese people can decide their own future. Now, in what's seen as a rare party meeting, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un orders for a fundamental change in regime's agriculture sector. This comes as recent reports suggesting that the North is facing serious food shortages, causing people to die from starvation. Kim Jong-un has called for radical change in North Korea's agricultural production within the next few years, amid growing concerns over alleged food shortages. Speaking at a key party meeting on Monday, the state-run Korean Central News Agency reported Tuesday that Kim stressed the importance of laying the foundation for the stable and sustained development of agriculture, as well as achieving grain production targets. Kim's remark comes days after South Korea's unification ministry noted that the North appears to be facing a grave food crisis, along with reports of deaths caused by starvation. The ministry said the food shortage is likely to have been caused by a decline in food production. Data from Statistics Korea shows that the amount of land used for rice cultivation in North Korea declined 0.8% on year in 2022, only three quarters of the land used in South Korea. Statistics Korea says the drop is likely due to poor weather conditions as well as COVID-19 affecting farming personnel. And to cope with the crisis, according to the World Food Program, North Korea needs an additional 13 million U.S. dollars until July. Currently, $42 million have been set aside to support North Korea. The WFP said it plans to resume support for children, pregnant women and the sick once North Korea decides to open its borders. Officials from the organization reportedly left Pyongyang when COVID-19 broke out in March 2020. Hopping over now to the south of Pyongyang, Seoul, Washington and Tokyo have held their first three-way dialogue on economic security, focusing on ways to cooperate on supply chains and emerging technologies. South Korea's Presidential Secretary for Economic Security, Wang Yunjong, met with his U.S. and Japanese counterparts in Honolulu on Monday after the leaders of the three countries agreed to launch the dialogue channel in their last summit last November. The three officials discussed various measures to foster cooperation in emerging and core sectors, including quantum, bio and space technologies. They also focused on stabilizing supply chains for memory chips, batteries and core minerals, along with countermeasures against moves that weaponize economic interdependence. South Korea and the U.S. held talks to discuss such issues last year, but decided to expand the dialogue to include Japan as a way to bolster trilateral relations. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. China has now accused the U.S. of overreacting after federal employees were ordered to remove the video app TikTok from government-issued phones. The White House gave government agencies a month to ensure that employees did not have the Chinese-owned app on federal devices. U.S. government agencies have 30 days to make sure TikTok is not on federal devices or systems. That was the order given by the White House on Monday. U.S. authorities believe the Chinese social media app could be used to spy on Americans. Washington's move follows similar actions by the EU and Taiwan. U.S. neighbor Canada also blocked TikTok from government-issued devices on Monday. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. We're making the decision that uh, for government uh, employees, for government equipment, um, it is better uh, to not have them access TikTok uh, because of the concerns uh, that people have in terms of safety. ByteDance-owned TikTok has previously argued the concerns are driven by misinformation. It's denied using the app to spy on Americans. China's foreign ministry criticized the U.S. decision Tuesday. We firmly oppose the U.S. side's wrong approach of overstretching the concept of national security, abusing national power and unreasonably suppressing the companies of other countries. 
The ban does not affect the more than 100 million Americans who use TikTok. The social media giant did not immediately comment on the White House order. Over in Ukraine now, President Zelensky says the situation in the city of Bakhmut on the eastern front line is getting increasingly tense as Russian forces are trying to take over. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, meanwhile, reaffirmed U.S. support for the war-torn nation during a visit to Kyiv. In Ukraine, Russian forces are trying to encircle the city of Bakhmut in the Donetsk region, the focal point of Russia's advances in eastern Ukraine. Russia has been trying to take over the city for over half a year. This comes as rain and an early spring thaw turned eastern Ukraine's battlefields to mud in which military vehicles are getting stuck. President Zelensky in his nightly address on Monday said that the situation in Bakhmut is becoming increasingly difficult. The enemy is constantly destroying everything that can be used to protect our positions for fortification and defense. Also on Monday, the U.S. Secretary of Treasury Janet Yellen made an unannounced trip to Kyiv and reaffirmed support for Ukraine. As we mark one year since the beginning of this full-scale invasion, the message I bring you from President Biden is simple. America will, will stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. Yellen met with President Zelensky, Prime Minister Denis Shmihal and other key government officials. Shmihal said that the two discussed further U.S. sanctions on Russia. Yellen announced the transfer of the 1.25 billion U.S. dollars from the latest 9.9 billion U.S. dollars tranche of economic and budget assistance from Washington. Meanwhile, Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova said that Moscow is disappointed by South Korea's decision to expand sanctions against Russia. That's according to TASS Russian news agency, which reported Zakharova's commentary published on Monday. South Korean government last week expanded the list of products that are subjected to export control before being shipped to Russia in a move joining other countries like the United States and those in Europe as they agree on more packages of sanctions. Now, during the run-up in crypto assets, traditional financial institutions like Visa and MasterCard scrambled to get in on the trend and announced new initiatives that involved Bitcoin, Ethereum or other cryptocurrencies. These same companies are now rethinking their strategy in the wake of the FTX collapse and additional negative industry events. Two of the biggest credit card companies are slamming the brakes on crypto. Visa and MasterCard are pushing back the launch of certain products and services related to crypto after a string of high-profile collapses rocked the industry and shook faith in the sector. That's according to two sources familiar with the matter, who told both companies will halt plans to forge new partnerships with crypto firms until market conditions and the regulatory environment improve. Over the past couple of years, major credit card firms had warmed up to crypto as the popularity of the asset class exploded, with some touting it as the next big thing in finance. MasterCard had teamed up with crypto lender Nexo in April to launch what it called the world's first crypto-backed payment card. And in October, Visa partnered with then-megahot exchange FTX, founded by so-called crypto wonderkind Sam Bankman-Fried. But by the end of 2022, the crypto industry saw a stunning reversal of fortunes, with industry majors BlockFi and FTX famously going belly up, and Bankman Freed charged with orchestrating one of the largest financial frauds in history. A spokesperson for Visa now tells that recent high-profile failures in the crypto sector are, quote, an important reminder that we have a long way to go before crypto becomes a part of mainstream payments and financial services. Hundreds of Peruvians left the southern Andean regions of the country to head to Lima to resume protests against President Dina Boluarte, which have already resulted in 48 deaths. Residents of the city of Yuli, located in the Puna region, 1,400 kilometers southeast of the capital, gathered to bid farewell to around 140 people who were preparing to board two buses to Lima. In a rural town by Lake Titicaca, hundreds of locals board a bus heading to Lima to protest in Peru's capital and demand the resignation of interim president Dina Boluarte. 
They have humiliated us, the Aymaras. So therefore, brothers, we are not going to allow that. We nationally only have one goal, the immediate resignation of the usurper, Dina Boluarte. The streets of Lima, which have been calm for some time, could see a repeat of the demonstration sparked by the ousting of former president Pedro Castillo in December. As Castillo's supporters, mostly indigenous people, will stop at nothing to have Dina Boluarte step down. The demonstrations throughout December and January had caused clashes between protesters and police, leaving almost 50 dead. Amnesty International released a report accusing the government of racist acts towards the indigenous people and violating human rights at the protests. During our research, we initially found that there was indeed not only excessive and disproportionate use of force by the military and police forces in controlling the protests, but in addition, there has been an illegitimate use of lethal and less lethal weapons that used indiscriminately have put the population's life, integrity and security at risk. Indigenous Peruvians have long struggled to gain political influence in the country, but remain loyal to Castillo, who they perceive as an ally in their fight against poverty, racism and inequality. Bola Tinubu, the politician long heralded as the father of modern Lagos, has won a tight race to succeed Muhammadu Buhari as the next president of Nigeria. Tinubu Bola Ahmed of the APC, having satisfied the requirements of the law, is hereby declared the winner and is returned elected. Thank you. Tinubu polled 8.8 .8 million votes to defeat former associate turn 4 Atiku Abubakar and surprise frontrunner Peter Obi, who scored 6.9 million and 6.1 million respectively to emerge president hours after three opposition parties called for a cancellation of what they called a sham of an election. President Muhammadu Buhari is stepping down after two terms in office, marked by economic stagnation and growing insecurity around the country. From an Islamist insurgency in the northeast to a nationwide crisis of kidnapping for ransom and separatist attacks in the southeast. Tinubu now has the task of solving these problems, amongst others, in Africa's most populous nation and biggest oil exporter. Earlier, the People's Democratic Party, Labour Party and African Democratic Congress had staged a press conference calling for the cancellation of the election results, saying the poll was a sham and merely vote allocation and not coalition. Many said his decision to go with another Muslim as a running mate would prove an obstacle, but it was not. Previously, all major parties have split their presidential tickets with a Christian from the South and Northern Muslim in order to achieve broad support across this vast nation of 210 million people. He will now have to prove that he can hit the ground running and that he is still the same formidable force who built modern Lagos, Nigeria's commercial hub. Tinubu will be taking charge of a crumbling economy, widespread insecurity and, as the result map shows, a country retreating into regional and religious blocks. Welcome back, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A landslide buried at least 10 houses in central Peru, isolating communities and destroying several crops. Footage captured by a witness showed the moment the mud slides down a slope, bringing down trees and houses on its way. Three-time champion Rafael Nada has withdrawn from the Masters 1000 event starting next week in Indian Wells due to injury. The 36-year-old Spaniard, who was one up last year in Indian Wells, has not competed since his Australian Open title defence in January and in a second-round defeat, even which he had related a hip problem. Two Iranian warships docked in Rio de Janeiro after Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva's government granted permission despite pressure from the United States to bar them. Footage show the Irish Macron warship anchored off the coast of Rio de Janeiro in front of the Copacabana fort. China's Xiaomi unveiled its GT3 smartphone that can be fully charged in just over nine minutes. They claim it's the world's fastest charging smartphone, with even a mere 30-second charge giving enough power for a two-hour 5G phone call. A massive fire consumed the plastic factory in Ecatepec, Mexico, causing a large plume of smoke that shocked locals. The fire at Distributora Reyma's factory prompted response from the fire department. 
that wraps up tonight's rendition of World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Now, before signing off, we head on to Paris, where duo models and celebrities, including Blackpink's Jisoo, strode around a hulking, fantastical set, turning familiar silhouettes in somber colors and stylized floral prints in the Paris Fashion Week. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.